Oh, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you realize your worry days are through. You'll be glad you were not idle, took time to read the Bible. It's a great, great morning for you. The B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. And now, here's our presenter, Gabriel Savant. Hello, everybody. I saw an editorial cartoon the other day of a character resembling, I guess, an Elijah or a Moses, bearded with long hair, holding up a sign reading, The End is Near. Right next to him is a COVID mask wearing medical doctor saying, I wish. <laughs> well, a motley crew of false prophets have gone far beyond any generic concept of the end is near. That's not pinpointed enough for these Holy Joes, many of them well-known figures, household names. So what they do is, they let it rip. They don't just wade in the kiddie pool. They dive off the deep end by hyping up their hooey, adding specific times. And all the while, they claim that the Lord has personally revealed to them the precise time that Jesus will return commencing the end to this present world system. So, what's the common denominator of Jehovah's Witnesses, Herbert W. Armstrong, Harold Camping, Pat Robertson, and Mormonism? What do they have in common? They all have a history of making prophecies about when the second advent of Christ would occur, and of course all of their prognostications have cratered, Next thing that these wannabe prophets have in common is, I submit that due to their pride, most probably, rarely if ever at all do any of them openly acknowledge when they lay an egg prophetically, after they allege they got their foreknowledge supernaturally, making holy God out to be a liar. But then, pride goeth before destruction, says the Bible, doesn't it? Jehovah's Witnesses have an abysmal track record of sounding false alarms about an impending doomsday or the day of the apocalypse, while they allege an invisible return of Jesus happened in 1914. How convenient that is to claim an invisible second coming of Christ. And how do you disprove a negative? You can't disprove a negative. Unless you stick to Bible truth, which absolutely refutes an invisible return of Jesus. For starters, see Revelation 1-7, which says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him when he cometh. Nothing undercover about that. But there's a whole boatload of J.W.'s false predictions. Charles Taze Russell, the first president of the Watchtower Society, calculated 1874 as the year of Christ's second coming, and the resurrection of the saints to happen in 1875. And further, he predicted the end of the harvest and the rapture of the saints to heaven for 1878. Huh? And the final end of the day of wrath, he projected that to be in 1914. For crying out loud, how many bites at the apple do you get, J.W.? Then there's J.F. Rutherford. J.F. Rutherford, who succeeded Russell as president of the Watchtower Society, he predicted that the Messiah's kingdom would be established by October 1st, 1925, and it would usher in worldwide peace. End quote. Yeah, right, and pigs fly. Just look around, almost 100 years after utopia was to occur on Earth, per the J.W., you don't see any peace in the world right now, do you? No, I don't either. Presently, there's instability and uncertainty, even chaos, both far and wide, on this planet in rebellion. J.W. Hierarchy went on a binge of making false prophecies. They had predicted that, quote, by 1925, biblical figures such as Abel, Noah, Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and John the Baptist would be resurrected as princes and give out instructions to their subjects by radio, and airplanes will transport people to Jerusalem from around the globe, end quote. 
Oh, sure. What a steaming pile that prediction was. Woo! The Watchtower Society even bought property and built a house called Beth Sarim, S-A-R-I-M, Beth Sarim, in California, for the return of those scriptural heroes of the faith, those princes, as they called them. But of course, they were no-shows. From 1966, statements in Jehovah's Witnesses publications raised strong expectations that Armageddon could arrive in 1975. In 1974, witnesses were commended, they were lauded, for selling their homes and property to, quote, finish out the rest of their days in this old system in full-time preaching, end quote. Four years later, the Watchtower Society admitted its responsibility in building up hope regarding 1975. They accepted some culpability for their unhinged theories about it, but that in no way exonerated their long line of pitiful predictions about the end of days prior to 1975. The toothpaste was already out of the tube by then. Instead of calling themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, they should be called Jehovah's False Witnesses, based on, among other things, since their inception in 1872, their knack for, even their propensity for falsely predicting over and over and over again when Armageddon will get rolling. But hey, JW is not on an island all by themselves. No. When it comes to hirelings who state publicly the supposed time when the Son of Man shall appear in the clouds, JW has plenty of company in that regard. There's Herbert W. Armstrong, the founder of the Worldwide Church of God. He predicted in a 1934 edition of the Plain Truth magazine that Christ would return in 1936. After that prediction failed, he doubled down in a 1940 edition of the Plain Truth, neither plain nor the truth, that said, quote, Christ will come after three and a half years of tribulation in October 1943, end quote. Well, after those predictions flopped and a number of his members started bolting for the exits, Armstrong moved his operation from Oregon to Pasadena, California. It was actively preached in sermons in the 1960s by ministers within Armstrongism that their members would need to flee to Petra, Jordan in 1972 and Christ would return three and a half years later. By that time, after several of his churches whacked out prophecies, Armstrong was rather gun-shy about setting any more specific dates, rightly so, but he still just couldn't seem to shake entirely his urge to prophesy when the end would arrive. He adamantly maintained that Christ would return before he died. So, Herbert W. Armstrong yet again made a phony baloney prophecy because he died in 1986. It seems these false prophets just can't contain themselves once they go out on a limb and declare to the world, Hey, y'all, I've got this insider information on this deal now, and you don't, so you just sit back and trust me on this, okay? It's absolutely appalling that they operate with such arrogance. It appears to be like it's a fix or a thrill they get in prognosticating on behalf of God, so they say. It reeks. As a sidebar, after Herbert W. Armstrong passed away, the empire he had created began to fall apart like a one-egg pudding. A power struggle took place, resulting in Herbert's original organization, tossing overboard many of their core doctrines, and finally, in 2009, they changed their name from Worldwide Church of God to Grace Communion International. Since Herbert's death in 1986, countless splinter groups emerged from vintage Armstrongism, dare I say several dozen of them, and breakaways continue to pop up to this day, with new offshoots springing up all the time here, there, and yonder. Offshoots of offshoots, all from the lineage, from the roots, 
of what Herbert W. Armstrong, the false prophet, launched or concocted in 1934 through what he billed as the Radio Church of God, eventually becoming the World Tomorrow broadcast. Here's the bottom line, folks. It's one thing to make a prediction about who you think might win a game between, say, the New York Yankees and the Los Angeles Dodgers and so forth. If your prediction turns out to be a dud, then no harm done. And I guess since we're talking baseball here, maybe I should say no harm, no foul. But it's a whole different kettle of fish anytime a sky pilot brazenly sticks his or her neck out to predict when Christ is returning or precisely when the end of the world is to occur. And when it backfires, it's an abomination since they're speaking where the Lord has not spoken. They're imposters is what they are. Abba Father utterly condemns anyone speaking out of turn, running ahead, or attaching His holy name to one of their defiled shenanigans. The Bible's definition of sin is 1 John 3, 4. It says sin is transgression of the law. But you know, sometimes I believe that sin stands for self-induced nonsense. And there's no doubt that false prophecies are a prime example of self-induced nonsense. There's the late Harold Camping, who predicted the rapture would occur on September 6, 1994. When that crashed and burned, he revised the date to September 29th. Then he pulled out all the stops by predicting the date for the judgment would instead be October 2, 1994. Do you see a pattern here? As if he was playing golf, Camping just decided to give himself a mulligan with his goofball prophecies. What hubris. Camping's fourth foolish prediction of the second coming of Christ, based on his sketchy exegesis, was in 1995, was for 1995. And who can forget Harold Camping's last prediction of the second coming of Christ, that he spelled out to be May 21st, 2011. That prophecy of his was also nothing but horse hockey. Camping died in 2013 as another repeat offender when it comes to being in the hall of shame of false seers, people who don't know beans about their haughty and pompous predictions that they make by twisting the scriptures. But yet they want to make as many people as possible think that they know what they're talking about, cause as many gullible souls they can fleece to think that they're in the know. What a farce. A word to the wise, don't ever buy a used car from one of these false shepherds. Their cars would come with a warranty, but you know what their standard warranty is? It's 90 days or 90 feet, whichever comes first. But wait, there's more. For almost 50 years, from 1966 to late 2021, televangelist Pat Robertson hosted his TV program called The 700 Club on his network, CBN. Christian Broadcasting Network. Well, according to U.S. News and World Report in their December 20th, 2012 edition, quote, popular Southern Baptist minister Pat Robertson predicted in 1976 that the world would end in October or November of 1982. After that did not happen, he tried again a decade later in his 1990 book, The New Millennium, He said the world would be destroyed on April 29, 2007, end quote. In 2020, in their October 20th edition, USA Today newspaper reported virtually the same identical article that U.S. News and World Report published, aforementioned. What's unique, though, about Pat Robertson vis-a-vis the others inside Christendom who feel it necessary to prophesy when the end of the world will happen, has been the fact that Pat has also many times thrust himself into the political arena, making his prophecies about who he claimed God showed him beforehand would win U.S. presidential elections. There's a whole string of these predictions Pat announced that he got from on high. It's absolutely stunning, as he did this, as if though it was just so casual for him, like water off a duck's back. On October 20, 2020, on his 700 Club show, Pat prophesied that, quote, 
after Trump will be sworn in as president, talking about a second term, there will be civic disobedience that will be just mind-boggling, end quote. Pat's prophecy about Trump being sworn in again when he ran against Joe Biden was wheels off. It was one giant fail is what it was. And make no mistake about it, that wasn't Pat's first time to falsely prophesy who would win a presidential race. No, no, no. In 2012, Pat was interviewed by another televangelist, Benny Hinn. Pat said in no uncertain terms that God assured him that Mitt Romney would beat Barack Obama, and Robertson made his unfounded prediction even worse by predicting that Romney would win a second term. It appears that Pat would have been better off just to take one election at a time rather than swinging for the fences predicting Romney would win the presidency twice when Mitt didn't even win it once. Pat was unquestionably steeped in prophesying presidential elections, and sadly, he kept claiming that he got his insights about it via a celestial signal, as it were. According to the January 3, 2004 edition of the Los Angeles Times, they reported, quote, Religious broadcaster Pat Robertson said Friday he believed God has told him President George W. Bush would be reelected in a blowout in November, end quote. Now, Pat's pipeline to the Lord had a glitch in it somehow because it was anything but a blowout. Remember the hanging chads fiasco in Florida? Remember that? Took them 36 days to finish that recount battle royal, and the final tally was a mere 537 popular vote difference in favor of Bush, who was America's 43rd president. Bush grabbed 271 electoral votes, just one more than the 270 required to win the Electoral College. So, contrary to what Pat Robertson purported that God told him before the election, only one who is in denial or who is out of touch with reality could spin it to say that Bush won by a blowout. Bush didn't blow out Al Gore in either the popular or the electoral vote count. What was a blowout is Pat's prediction, like a blowout of a tire while driving on the highway. Now, that was George W. Bush in that scenario. But then there's his late father, George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st U.S. president, who was in office for one term. Well, no shock that Pat Robertson weighed in on his election, too. At least Bush's second one he did. He once again pulled out his metaphorical crystal ball. On the 700 Club, Pat Robertson, in a very matter-of-fact tone, said that, quote, President Bush is going to be re-elected handily. There's just no question about it. <laughs> the Lord showed me that in 1991, and he showed it to me again in 1992, that George Bush is going to be re-elected for another term, end quote. Newsflash. Bush Sr. was defeated by Bill Clinton in 1992. Pat Robertson should receive a dunce award for all of his so-called God-supplied, God-furnished prophecies about presidential races that went off the rails. Don't know how Pat could have kept churning out his balderdash all those years with these prophecies that he said God gave him that ultimately turned out to be nothing but a prototype for fake news, the epitome of fake news. There are three types of memory good memory, bad memory, and selective memory. Perhaps Pat was using selective memory. But you talk about irony. This right here is as ironic as the Department of the Interior managing things that are outdoors. As published in the Christian Post report dated October 4th, 2011, it says, quote, during the Bring It On segment on CBN's The 700 Club broadcast Tuesday, the host shared a viewer's question on how to discern false prophets who relay an erroneous word from the Lord. Pat Robertson, known for making a few curious prophecies and predictions of his own, told viewers during Tuesday's broadcast of the 700 Club to be careful of false prophets and that people offer an erroneous word from the Lord all the time. End quote. 
Now, if that's not a classic case of the pot calling the kettle black, then what in the world is? And I'd be remiss to not also mention the charlatan who was known for what was described in history as the Great Disappointment, William Miller, a licensed Baptist preacher, a Sunday-keeping Baptist, by the way, from Massachusetts, was able to wangle about 100,000 followers to support him. They were known as Millerites or Adventists. They got on his bandwagon. Miller prophesied that Christ's second advent will take place between March 21, 1843 and March 21, 1844. Miller botched it. So how did Miller handle the embarrassment when his date came and went and, and none of those Millerites dressed in ascension robes, many of them, none of them were called up to meet Jesus in the air? How did he handle that? Miller said, quote, um, uh, I actually meant October 22nd, 1844, end quote. Ah, well, that's what they do, like Harold Camping did. They just move the goalposts and set another date, buy some more time by kicking the can down the road until they finally run out of road. What a travesty. Miller was just another one of those self-absorbed, attention-seeking false prophets who was selling nothing but hogwash. Miller never did become a Seventh-day Adventist, and he remained a Sunday keeper the rest of his days. Yet, not long after William Miller's bizarre prophecies went down in flames, out of those symbolic ashes rose the Seventh-day Adventist Christian movement. There's no doubt about it. Miller was a misguided and miserable false prophet who was educated beyond his intelligence. He allowed his ego to get the best of him. Could be that the huge amount of newspaper coverage he was receiving from all over America at that time, could be that it went to his head. The fallout, though, from his kooky biblical interpretations led lots of people who had gotten on board with his malarkey to sell all their earthly possessions prior to Miller's predicted dates, and a number of them became hardcore atheists due to their utter discouragement when it all came to naught. The Bible says that we will all be judged for every thought, word, and deed when we will all appear before God in the day of judgment to give an account for ourselves, for our deeds done in the body. And all of these false prophets will, of course, also have to answer for their sins, including their abominable and reprehensible prophecies, false prophecies, done in the name of the Lord of the universe. How shameful. Hebrews 9.27 says, For it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. You know, I quite often hear some people say rather cynically about the day of judgment. They'll say something like, Well, I, I guess that's going to be a really long line, huh? Never mind that aspect of it. God's got all the time in the world, and he's in no hurry. Never forget that he's operating by his timetable. However long that line is, everyone will have to wait for their turn to go through the turnstiles in the day of judgment on this earth. Every human being who's ever lived is going to keep that appointment, like it or not, with no absences, no excuses allowed. My friend, let us heed the warning in Amos 4.12, prepare to meet thy God. And going back about 10 years before William Miller became moonstruck, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism and the one who LDS Church regards as their very first prophet, made his own prediction about when the end of time would take place. I'm quoting here from a Mormon document, quote, President Smith then stated that the meeting has been called because God had commanded it, and it was made known to him by vision and by the Holy Spirit. It was the will of God that they should be ordained to the ministry and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time for the coming of the Lord, which was nigh even 56 years should wind up the scene. End quote. History of the Church, Volume 2. Page 182. Now, this prophecy was spoken by Joseph Smith in 1835 and recorded by Oliver Cattery. The 56 years ended in 1891. Do the math. 1835, 56, 1891, it ended. 
And the key to what Joseph Smith erroneously predicted, and you can't skew it, you can't spin it in order to try to whitewash it, is this point of fact. Joseph Smith said, those certain ones who were attending that specially called meeting were told they should be ordained and go forth for the last time. The last time, as the coming of the Lord was nigh. Nigh means something is at hand. It's imminent. And certainly, 1891, when the prophecy concluded to 2022, is a whopping 131 years past anything that could be regarded as nigh or at the door. Who knows? Joseph Smith might have eaten too much spicy food, akin to eating a pepperoni pizza late at night, resulting in his off-the-wall prediction. LDS was built on a house of cards, as it was started by a bogus clairvoyant who declared a prophecy about when Christ would return, which wound up being not any prophecy from God, but one that Joseph Smith must have gotten from someplace out in the ozone. As an addendum, Joseph Smith also prophesied that the U.S. government would soon be demolished. Joseph Smith said, quote, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God of Israel, unless the United States redress the wrongs committed upon the saints in the state of Missouri and punish the crimes committed by her officers, that in a few years the government will be utterly overthrown and wasted, and there will not be so much as a shard of broken ceramic remaining due to their wickedness in permitting the murder of men, women, and children, and the wholesale plunder and extermination of thousands of her citizens to go unpunished. End quote. History of the Church, Volume 5, page 394. Joseph Smith made that prophecy in May 6, 1843. However, the United States government did not redress any of the wrongs committed against the Mormons in Missouri, and now, over 175 years later, the U.S. government still stands, yet Joseph Smith, in that prophecy, take a look at it again, he said in just a few years, and he made that prophecy in 1843, the U.S. government would no longer exist. Further validation that Joseph Smith was a big fraud, and these examples of his prophecies I've just shared were hocus-pocus, full stop, period. Friends, to invoke the name of the Almighty in connection to a prophecy about the end of days, or anything else as far as that goes, presidential race or what have you, when you invoke God's name and attach his name and his authority and his character to it and say you got it from him, and when it does not come true, it's an egregious flagrant, inexcusable transgression of God's law. Plus, it does untold harm to the cause of Christ, inducing skeptics of the truth, and even new converts, babes in Christ, inducing them, causing them to begin to doubt their faith and become more skeptical, confused, and disenchanted about the Bible. In Matthew chapter 7, it refers specifically to these self-serving deceivers and false prophets. Jesus said, quote, many will say to me on that day, talking about the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, end quote. Don't forget, Satan is also a fisher of men, and his nets are overflowing. Thanks for listening. Please tell others about my transmissions. This is your channel for present truth Bible teaching. These installments are a product of Abba's Messengers SDA, an independent Christian ministry. Until next time, this is Gabriel Savant reminding you an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but reading a chapter of the Bible a day keeps the devil away. B -I -B -L -E. Yes, that's the book for me. The B-I-B-L-E Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth